please join with me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that, as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Our Old Testament reading is Deuteronomy 18, 14 through 22. Although these nations that you are about to dispossess do give heed to soothsayers and diviners, as for you, the Lord your God does not permit you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the, Lord of the, hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. You may say to yourself, how can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? <clears throat> if a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be frightened by it. Our gospel reading is Mark 1, 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept, ask, kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. In 2009, a man named Mark Templin went to the VA hospital in Fort Harrison, uh, suffering from chest pains. And they went ahead and they put in a stent. And shortly after they did that, he began experiencing dizziness and uh, some trouble with his speech. He went back to the VA and they diagnosed him with a terminal brain tumor. They gave him some medication that they hoped would alleviate the symptoms and then sent him home. He quit his job, sold his truck, threw a farewell birthday party for himself, but then he started to get better. And he went back to the doctor and they told him, oops, you don't have a brain tumor. You had a couple of mini strokes. You're going to be just fine. Well, he eventually went on to sue them, but I began to think about it. Whoever that doctor was, I don't know if I would truck that, trust that doctor to diagnose uh, me with dandruff. This is one of the things that the scripture is saying, and, and it's dressed up, it's talking about prophets and the word of the Lord, but it's saying something so obvious, you wonder why God is taking the time to tell us. If somebody that you're looking to for advice says something that doesn't happen, or it turns out that what they said wasn't true, don't be afraid of them. Don't listen to them. Just forget what they said. On the other hand, the passage does say, I will send prophets. The truth is out there, as they used to say in the X-Files. It's up to you to hear it and find it and follow it. Now, that first scripture, we may think, well, we don't really have soothsayers and diviners anymore. In a way, they were like the doctors in the old times. You would go to them and they would... Uh, try to discern what was wrong and prescribe a remedy. Uh, there's an island in the Mediterranean that if you visit it, there's a temple of Asclepius. They were all around the Mediterranean. People would travel there 
and they would go to the soothsayer who would try to divine what was wrong with them and give them a procedure to go through. It might be a poultice, some remedy, and then tell them to go sleep under a rock or in a cave and then say, maybe the God will come to you in a dream and tell you what to do further. But in one way or another, uh, it's basically giving advice on how to fix problems. And it's not just doctors who do that with our bodies. There's all kinds of experts out there who want to tell us how to fix what's wrong with the society, what's wrong with the environment. And for a year and a half now, scientists in their own community have been writing articles about the crisis in science's credibility. They're wondering what happened. Why aren't people listening to us anymore? Well, I could tell them immediately, and it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that, for instance, a third of the experiments that they do in psychology, and then they come out and say why people do this and what it means, about a third of those experiments, when they do them again, they don't get the same results. Oops. It's not that. It's when I remember growing up, um, it was in the 70s. It's so about the time my family moved to California, and they had a commercial out where there's a kid that's sitting there saying, I just found out that we're running out of gasoline. He says, we use a ton of it just every week. And the camera pans back and you see a whole railroad yard just full of storage tanks. And he says, if you don't do something, there won't be any gas when I grow up. Hey, adults, give us kids a chance for the same America you had. And that kind of caught me for a minute or two until I realized well, if we're running out, so if I get some, they're still going to run out eventually, either the grandkids or the great-grandkids, so it didn't make much sense. But secondly, they were kind of appealing to my own selfishness. Um, that's a point worth noting, because a lot of the hooks that we have out there, they instill in us fear and then appeal to our own selfishness. But guess what? That didn't happen. We not only don't, haven't run out of gas, we're using more than we ever have. And what they said just didn't come true. And if you think about why is there so much disagreement about something like global warming, which I won't get into, it's because they have made specific predictions that just didn't happen. They have lost their credibility. They basically showed themselves by the, the, a common sense standard to be false prophets, and people just aren't afraid of them anymore. Remember when eggs were bad for everybody, and then they were good, and now they're okay? When everyone needed to stop coffee, and then they discovered it had antioxidants in it? When it was a good idea to stay away from the saturated fats in butter, so let's switch to the cheaper margarine, and we found out that the trans fat that we artificially make is the worst thing for us, apparently, in the universe. It's not our fault that we may not trust them, what they said turned out not to be true. But I have another question for them. Why is this a crisis? Who appointed you to be my prophet? And what exactly are you trying to tell me that I need to hear? I have a, uh, a friend that I got into a Facebook conversation with not too long ago. And he dropped a few things. And, and I realized that he was talking to me about... Um, the human brain and how it evolved, and he talked to me about evolutionary psychology, and I really didn't have room on Facebook, but there's a big problem with that. Um, it's very popular in the magazines, psychologists use it, the idea of looking at evolution and why did we evolve a certain way. Richard Dawkins, who's a rather evangelical atheist, has a point in his book, The Selfish Gene. The gene doesn't have really any purpose other than to be selfish, to make more copies of itself. And not even tongue-in-cheek, more than one biologist has quoted that old proverb that your entire life is nature's way of making another human being, another embryo. Because a chemical reaction, which is all evolution is, can no more desire or want something or be selfish than a fire can want to burn. It simply goes on after it started until it runs out of fuel or the conditions are no longer right and it stops. That's a problem. Because I bet these scientists all get out of bed in the morning as though their lives mattered. As though it was important to try to find meaning and purpose in life, to enjoy their work, to cherish their friends and family. That doesn't make sense. 
in terms of their philosophy, they would be utter hypocrites to live as though their life mattered. And yet they do. I don't think it's because they're inconsistent. I think it's because they were created by God and there's some lies so ridiculous we can't even succeed in telling ourselves. But there's more to it and something more fundamental. Whenever we think about the importance of science, it's really there just for technical problem solving. An illustration I've used once before that is great to me, it's Owen Gingrich. Uh, was a quantum physicist, I think he still is, and he gave a lecture to people at Harvard to try to explain to them why he believed in God. And he was very polite, and I think many of them missed his point. He opened with an illustration. He said, when I get up in the morning and, and make my morning cup of tea, I fill the kettle with water, I put it on the stove, and I turn on the heat, and he says, now I, I want to ask you a question, why does the water boil? Well, of course, we all know it. The electricity flows through the heating element or the gas burns. You get thermal energy that is transmitted to the body of the kettle, and then the atoms of the metal are excited and they transfer that random motion to the water until eventually all the water molecules bouncing on the surface, their pressure upward exceeds the atmospheric pressure downward and the stickiness of the molecules. That's why the water boils. He says, yes, that's the scientific answer, but there's another reason why the water boiled. Because I wanted a cup of tea. That's what we care about. Those are the answers that we're really looking for. The, those kinds of whys, they apply to human being, not the material reality that science can presumably tell us about. All the really important questions, it's utterly powerless to answer. It would be as though we were trying to draw a sledgehammer on a piece of paper, cut it out, and use it to drive a railroad spike. A two-dimensional idea for a three-dimensional reality. They're just not up to the task. So how is anyone satisfied with a scientific explanation? What kind of lives are they living that it would seem that that would be enough? That they didn't really need any of that other religious stuff? I think it's because they and most of us, most of the time, are living in a survival mode. We're just responding to problems and evils that come along. And that's really what life is. It's a response, an answer or just a response to a stimulus. That's a good definition of life as you'll ever find in biology. It's something that is able to respond to a stimulus and not just react. And we need to respond to various things like our need for food and clothing and shelter. We have a need to be loved or just esteemed. And finally, I guess we need to feel that our lives have a purpose. And that's the why question that no scientist can give, ever give us an answer to. We can, however, invest ourselves in false purposes. That idea of, of thinking, yeah, we know there are more important things in life. Well, sometimes people will toss around that phrase. Well, that reminds us what's really important. We get a sense that that's referring to other people, relationships, family, but no one can actually define it or say why it has meaning. But the false purpose is always the new crisis, the things that threaten whatever is important. And the world is full of prophets to identify these crises and what they are and how we can solve them. And we spend our whole life just trying to survive. Well, life is or should be a lot more than just survival. At some point, we should have enough crises dealt with that we stop and ask ourselves the question, is this all there is? Taking care of problems until the grave takes care of us. Jesus said something interesting in the Gospel of John when he's talking about the Good Shepherd. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In a certain sense, you know, everything is out to get you in the world. Even if you imagine an idyllic lake and a mountain and think, that must be like paradise. It's a warm summer's day. You can have a, a nice swim in there with the person most important to you in your life. 
But somebody might come along and say, yeah, but remember about that brain-eating amoeba? Mm, maybe you shouldn't take that swim. Or somebody who picks up a cute little snu uh, cuddly kitten from the street. Oh, somebody's abandoned the poor thing. Isn't this the most delightful thing? Well, the person who abandoned it probably didn't pay for shots. It may have just met a skunk. This could be the last time I see you. You know, maybe that kitten should be dressed up in black cloth and carrying a scythe. Everything is potentially out there to get us. From my point of view, on the simplest level, I just think, okay, God has put us in a world where we're supposed to get the point that there are some things at risk. There are consequences. There's something at stake. It's not completely safe in that regard. But there is one thing, one thing that we can be sure is not out to get us intentionally. Everything's out to get us intentionally in the terms of the science-wise. But God is not out to get us. That's the unclean spirit. What are the first words, or second words? It says, have you come to destroy us? It just sees God as a threat, whatever that unclean spirit is. All human beings, they may be out to get us, or they may just make mistakes like that doctor. But the only person when it comes to those deeper why questions that is totally trustworthy and absolutely is not out to get us is God. That was shown to us in Jesus Christ. There's something else that makes a, a spirit unclean beside of it being um, locked into a survival mode where all it's trying to do is avoid danger. It's a servant of fear and it sees the one being who can give it purpose as somehow an enemy. What have you to do with us? As though God were somehow irrelevant. And this happens all the time. There are plenty of Christians who are also scientists, but a very interesting statement was made by Richard Lewontin. He's an evolutionary biologist. And it's a curious and a sad mindset. He says this, we take the side of science. Right there, it's like a battle or something. Why is he taking sides? Does science take sides? He's sneaking in that notion of intentional agency and not just materialism. But he says we do this despite the patent absurdity of some of science's constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes, our devotion to materialism, to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations no matter how counterintuitive. It's another way of saying no matter how ridiculous, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, as though God were a threat. God were utterly irrelevant to what was going on. Maybe there's a fear that, that God will actually come to steal and kill and destroy what I have. That is a very, very unclean spirit. All that's, that's real to me in terms of, of who I am or you, not on the material scientific level, but as a person, is going to have to respond to something that is also at least a person. And since we can't really trust anyone, the only one left is God. This was one of those issues that I kind of sorted through a long time ago of how do people actually come up believing that, well, we don't need a God. We've studied the brain and we see how it works. And 
Imagine, if you will, that there's a little toy that you drag across the ground. And as the wheels are turning, the head pops up and down. And somebody says, why does the head pop up and down? And I look at the car and I say, oh, I see why. Um, the head is sitting on top of a little pole that goes down to the rear axle. And the rear axle has this bump on it. So as the wheel turns, it causes the head to move up and down. If I were then to ask, yes, but why does the head move up and down? The question would be utterly bizarre. And yet, no matter how much I study the brain, I understand where the visual stimuli go, where they're processed, where they're sent. I know where certain thinking happens in the prefrontal cortex. I even know why it feels the way it does when I wake up because of something called the reticular activating system. I can still ask, yes, but why does that support a being such as myself, a conscious being, an agent who can do things, who has a sense of purpose? I can always ask that question no matter how much information they give me. And for some reason, some people are unable to see that that kind of conclusively proves that all the really important questions in I, that I have in my life, all the science you can give me is just that paper sledgehammer. It's never going to do the job. There is no crisis in science. I hope they do a good job solving the problems we have, and I'd be willing to discuss it with them. But they're not my prophet, and they're not my soothsayer. For all the things that are really important, I really only have one place to go. Everything that's real to me, that is me, is an answer to God. And in that sense, that should be true of every community that I have a need to be a part of. If that community isn't in some way responding to God, or it thinks God is irrelevant, or it's afraid of allowing the God in the door as though there was going to be a divine foothold in it, that's not a community. It won't need my, meet my needs for community. It's another paper sledgehammer. And the same thing is true for any, any supposed purpose in life. It's likely to be another one of those crises of the moment where we're just trying to find out the way to, save the lo the, to solve the most recent emergency just so that life can go on. Existence for the sake of existence. Life is a question asked by God of you, of me, of all of us. And the question is, how are we going to respond? Whether on the largest scale, why is the universe the way it is? Or on the smallest scale, why am I here? It's because God wanted to make a cup of tea. And my question today is, why aren't all of us boiling? Why isn't the, the kettle of the church why isn't it boiling? Why isn't the fire of the Holy Spirit boiling that water for whatever cup of tea is coming? Why isn't every church, like a tea kettle, whistling over that inspiration of the Holy Spirit, ready to be used for God's purpose? I think one of the things that we should always be working on is to make sure we don't let that unclean spirit get a foothold in the door believing that God is ever irrelevant or can be safely set aside or comfortably ignored or that the divine foot can be left out of whatever it is we're doing or committing to. That was the first question the demon asked, what have you to do with us? That was what the unclean spirit said. And the next question was, have you come to destroy us? First becomes the idea of irrelevance. That God isn't relevant. God is in fewer and fewer portions of somebody's life until they suddenly realize or don't realize that the entire way they think about their life and they live it, they couldn't go on doing it if they actually admitted the presence of God into their lives. God's not trying to destroy anything. I come not to steal, kill, or destroy. I come only to get your eyes off of what is nothing is a bare, empty mode of existing for the sake of existing, running from one fear to another, one crisis to another, to introduce you into what it really means to have life. Last week, we, we touched on that, how the kingdom of heaven was not something tangible. But as Paul said, 
uh, the kingdom of heaven is um, righteousness, joy, peace in the Holy Spirit. And if you want to see it put into practice, uh, and I've recommended this book before, it can be a little hard to get through if you haven't got a good translation, but St. Augustine's Confession. It was the first autobiography. That's what you'll hear if you go to an English class. Wow, nobody ever before thought, one person's life? Why would I want to read about that? Talk to me about the Punic Wars or the fall of Greece or something, but your life? Who cares? But if you read that autobiography, the whole thing is a prayer to God. That's what made his life of eternal significance because he couldn't make sense of it apart from how he had come in contact with God, how God had changed his heart, had taken him to places he never would have gone to before. His entire life is like a prayer. He can only make sense of it in terms of it being a response, an answer to the God who gave life to him. And that's what made it worthy. And that's probably why every autobiography that isn't similarly written it just sounds like so much self-congratulation. God is never irrelevant. And also, God is not out to get you or hurt you or, for that matter, anyone else. I don't care how rotten they look on the outside, what terrible things they might be doing. God's not out to get them either. Jesus said, I did not come to steal, kill, or destroy, but that they might have life and have life abundantly. So the truth is out there. It's also in here. And it's our job to find it and to respond to it. And that can be sort of intimidating. It's a natural human tendency to want to go to an authority, to do what the people in the Old Testament did, where God said, yeah, they speak well, why don't I send them prophets to speak to them, to tell them what to do? Because they just can't handle life with me. We're past that point. We're living in the age that Jeremiah writes about when he says, no longer will people say, know the Lord, know the Lord, for they will all know me. We just all need to listen and stand up and respond to God. The world can be confusing sometimes. This is what happened to Job. And at the final climax of that book, do you remember when he said, all right, Job, stand up. Gird your loins, it means get ready for actions. I will question and you will answer me. Do you remember how Job did in that test? He got a zero. Couldn't answer a single question. And he passed. Passed with flying colors. It turned out, if you remember the end of that book, that he was justifiably confused. His friends kept telling him, you know what, we know you've sinned. That's the only reason you're having trouble. Just repent, believe the way we do, and everything will go great. What really got him, and the reason his questions dropped, is he came to see, to know, to experience for himself the glory of God. And he says, I, I repent in dust and ashes. Withdraw my complaint. But through that process, his friends also realized that they were wrong. Sometimes we read the book of Job and we miss that point of all the theatrics at the beginning. But at the end, these three friends who never would have gotten together with Job had tragedy not struck the way he did, would never have sat with him, would never have given him their wrong-headed ideas unless all that bad stuff had happened. And in the end of the book, they're the ones who need to be saved. And they are. Job's three best friends in the world wind up knowing the God who created them and knowing him in truth. They were saved from their error and shown the glorious truth of God. So in closing, I guess I just want to reiterate, as much as that message is out there, kind of, subterranean, but it's implicit in a lot of the messages we're getting. Life, you're not an amoeba. Stimulus, response, stimulus, response. Your life is a question asked by God. And God is the only one able and the only one who can be trusted to help you answer it. And he promised that he will 
if you give him a chance. And he promises in the larger sense that he will help us answer that question if we just come and listen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the spirit in our hearts through which we can call you Father, through which we can find our meaning and our purpose and our fulfillment. However empty we may feel on our own, in you there is fullness. We ask that you would show us, one by one, what you want us to do daily, what you want us to do with our lives. And we ask you, as your gathered people, to bring us to a boil and to help us learn what cup of tea it is we're supposed to be making. We thank you and trust you and ask that you would keep all the wax out of our ears and force us to pay attention when you speak and give us the wisdom to listen. We don't need any false soothsayers or prophets. You have given us your son and through him the assurance of your love that now, finally, we have a source of wisdom and guidance and a companion who can be totally and fully and forever trusted. We do thank you for this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.